thank you so much for joining us on this very, very wet day. I have to say that we thought that numbers would be down given the weather, but you can see the enthusiasm for this topic by the fact that extra chairs are being pulled out. So thank you for making it out on this, on this what has been a pretty horrible day, but for what will be a very interesting discussion. Um, I'm Professor Rosie Campbell. I'm the director of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership here at King's College London, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this event. Um, we're holding it with the experimental government team at the Policy Institute as part of the ESRC Festival of Social Science. And the theme this year is lifelong well-being, and it's clear to everyone that participation in sport, whether at the elite level or in the school playground, is a key to this. Um, there's been a lot of laughter in uh, my department over the last few days that I'm chairing this because I literally could not know less about competitive sport. Um, but, you know, I've, I've been reflecting on that for the five years I've been in this job, and I realised that the gender norms that affect all of us had a deep effect on me. It's probably not hard to imagine that I was quite an assertive little girl. The kind of... The, the word that was used at the time was bossy. And so when the boys and, and when sport was gendered as a male thing, I just thought, if you don't want me to play, I am not playing. So I just never paid any attention. I loved Wonder Woman, I loved dance, and I was not at all interested in sport. And it's been a real eye-opener for me to just see how much the world has changed. I've got a 15-year-old and a 13-year-old daughter who absolutely love sport. And I can see what it gives them in terms of team spirit, collaboration, resilience, leadership skills is absolutely fantastic and it makes me realize what I missed out on. Such an important issue. So despite my lack of expertise, I'm so excited that we're having this event here tonight. In the context of the triumph of the England Lionesses in the Euro 22 and the England women's cricket, you see I have to read this stuff, um, World Cup success in 2018, we now, I, I think one of the things that really made a huge difference to me is I never listened to Radio 5. Do I, I don't know if any of you do. I call it sport radio. And I think, why isn't the fashion radio where news is interrupted with clothes items? But um, what I realised, I was driving home and I had Radio 4 on, and they're talking about the World Cup. They never once said the Women's World Cup. And I actually felt a little bit tearful because, my God, the world has changed the better. So another reason why we're so excited to be hosting this this evening. So in terms of the format for this evening, we're going to start with my colleague from the experimental government team, um, Professor Michael Sanders, who's going to show, share with us some research that they've been doing. And again, I don't even know what this means. Double headers in cricket. Over to you, Michael. Thanks, Rosie. Uh, so I don't have Rosie's excuse of having been a little girl. <laughs> but also didn't take part in sport as a child, possibly because I'm lazy? Who knows? There's a, something to work through in therapy there. Anyway, here we are. So I'm going to be talking about some research that we've is hot off the presses if we were to still actually print anything using presses. It's sort of warm off the PDF generator, which is somewhat less exciting as a thing to say, I have to say. No one ever says, stop the PDF generator! <laughs> Uh, maybe they should. Anyway, so this is it's brand new research we haven't talked about it anywhere before, so I'm very excited about it, um, particularly because, uh, as uh, my colleague George uh, knows, I have a love of putting a pop culture reference in the title for things, uh, and I've been able to do that and get it past him today. So this is a good victory for me, and the rest of you get to be here for it, which I suppose is also nice. Um, so despite not having played sport, I'm going to talk about it for a while. So there is substantial in inequality in the pay and prizes afforded to players in different sports, cutting heavily across gender lines, right? You get paid much more to be a male sports person on average than a female sports person, and that's especially true if you win things. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a problem. Um, and that's it's, it, we can consider this as a problem along equity lines. Like, it's just not fair. It is not fair that men and women undertaking the same activity in what is ultimately, in this context, a workplace, get paid differently. That's, that's not fair at all. You can also consider it along practical lines if you're minded to do so. So the, the, the practical argument is capitalism exists and there's less money in women's sport, therefore we're going to pay the women less. Uh, I don't particularly buy that argument, but I thought for the sake of completeness, I had space for an extra bullet point in my slide, I should mention it. In case anyone was going to say afterwards, oh, well, actually, I think you'll find capitalism exists. For the reason economics, I know capitalism is. I don't know the rules of any sports, but capitalism I'm familiar with. So, 
this sort of the gaps in realized interest, which means to say people being less interested in women's sport can be viewed as being a problem of incomplete information. So if you've never watched a women's cricket match or a women's football match, then how do you know you're not interested in it? Right? So you have, you have incomplete information. And it's amazing the number of people who a few years ago were like, I don't know, I wouldn't watch that because it's not as interesting, is it? So I don't know, I've never watched either. But I feel like I find them equally as boring in concept. So I don't know why you're really keen on this one and completely disinterested in that one. It makes literally no sense logically. And I really want people to behave logically because as you will tell as we go along, I'm basically just a statistician. So we also have, as we've observed over the last few years, we have, there is an not just an incomplete information problem, but also an incorrect forecasting problem, which is to say, we think we're not going to enjoy watching a thing until we actually do it, and then we realize that we do. So I'm not an expert on sport, as you may be gathering from the fact that I've belabored that point for the last three minutes. But like, it doesn't appear to me that over the course of the last decade or so, women have gotten much, much, much better at football, right? We, people are much, much more excited about women playing football and cricket and other sports, but I don't think that it's because they've suddenly got better. It's because they've been exposed to it and they realize actually it's really interesting. Maybe they have gotten better. There's a good reason to believe that investment will lead to improvements, but I, I don't think the magnitude of the one can explain the other, right? It, it must just be that it was really interesting all along and we just didn't know it was there. From my perspective, same deal with Doctor Who. Anybody who hasn't seen it? You have a, if you don't think you're gonna like it, that is an incorrect forecasting problem. There's 60 years to catch up on. It's great. You watch it for long enough, David Tennant comes around again. Amazing. So, this is the, there are practical reasons this is a problem, and there are utility and preference reasons to overcoming these errors, right? People are making mistakes. We can make them happier and better off if we can correct these errors. If we can get people to say, oh, actually, this is great fun. I can watch twice as much football or cricket or, you know, Doctor Who. We had a brief spell of, like, women's Doctor Who, but we had a, a woman in, in the lead role. Not quite long enough, but never mind. It'll come around again. If you wait long enough, Doctor Who, everything comes around again. Time, innit? Anyway, so there are good reasons to believe we should be trying to fix these problems. So, in the UK, we've got, for those of you who aren't super familiar with cricket, we have a short format game of cricket called The 100. Those of you who are a bit familiar with cricket will know that cricket comes in overs of six balls, and so historically, everything has had to be multiples of six. We decided to do away with that kind of like introducing the metric system. Now everything is multiples of five, which is great, helpful when you've got a five-year-old trying to get into maths who's very into sport. Like how many overs is that in, in normal cricket? How many overs is that in the 100? So you play for 100 balls each way. That means people throw balls at you if you're one side 100 times and then you switch over and do it the other way. It's generally how sports work if in that kind of format. Sometimes people are going at it at the same time, very confusing. This is much easier. You can tell who's, who's doing what at any given moment in time. Americans in the audience do not confuse this for me thinking that American football where you switch teams all the time is good. It isn't. So, short format cricket in the UK. Fairly recent, supposed to start in 2020. Cancelled for some reason? I can't remember why they cancelled that in 2020. Anyway, so that happened. And you have women's foot tournament and a men's tournament. In Australia, you've got a horribly blurry picture of a 2020 tournament, a very big tournament called the Big Bash Tournament, very Australian name. We call it the 100 to date, numerical. They call it the Big Bash because you're hitting it bigly. Or hard? I don't know. Anyway, that's, that's 60 balls, uh, 120 balls each way. Uh, so again, short format, and you have a men's tournament and a women's tournament. That's not very interesting. The thing that's interesting from our purposes is single versus double header events. So in a single header event, you buy a ticket and you go and watch a cricket match. And that's the men's cricket match, or it's the women's cricket match, and you go and you watch the thing, and then you go home. Probably there's food in the middle, I don't know. Is there an interval in football, if it's cricket? No? No interval? Fine. Everything should have an interval. Uh, including this talk, possibly. Whereas doubleheader events, you buy one ticket, you can go and see two matches on the same day in the same place. So you go and see the women's match and the men's match, typically in that order. So the idea here is, by going to see a women's match, as well as the men's match you were probably thinking you were going to like, you might get more interested in women's cricket, and isn't that wonderful? Um, so that's the sort of hypothesis. So our question is, do double-header events make a difference to the level of interest in women's cricket relative to single-header events? And unfortunately, 
We can't tell that in England because our data is because all of our matches are double headers. So we, so we have no source of identification. What we're going to use is data from the Big Bash tournament, and we're going to use Google. That's an annoying noise. Uh, we're going to use Google Trends data so we can see the rate at which people are searching for the names of different women cricketers. And we know which teams they're in because people are interested in sport and they put all that stuff on the internet. It's great. So we can look at how many people are searching today relative to yesterday for cricket player X or cricket player Y. And we can see that for all of the days in the history of Google, which is quite a lot. I think Google's quite recent, but it turns out I'm just quite old. And then we can do the same thing for Wikipedia. So in Wikipedia, we can see how many people visit each page on Wikipedia every day. Don't cite Wikipedia in your essays if you're a student, but you may use the data for your research if you're a PhD student. It's an unfair rule. I don't make the rules, I just enforce them. So we're going to use those data to see whether or not double headers lead to more interest in women's cricket than single headers. Descriptively, here's what we see in these data sets over time, where zero here is the day, is the, day the match happens. This is the day of the match. We see lots of people, relatively, going to the Wikipedia pages and searching on Google for the names of women cricketers, right? So given the fact that you're more likely to search for a women cricketer, a women cricketer who's playing cricket today than you are one that's going to play cricket tomorrow, that suggests this is a, a measure that moves with some level of interest in cricket, or women's cricket, and specifically these women cricketers. Right, that's what we're going to do. Now, we have to get what's called causal identification. Right? I can't just correlate stuff and say it's causal because it's not the 90s anymore, but I can't get away with that in journals. Things they've rejected. Rubbish. It's another way which has become harder to become a straight white man in this blah, blah, blah. Anyway. <laughs> so what are we doing? We're exploiting the fact that in the Australian tournament, you have single header events in which only women are playing at a, at a ground on a day, and double header events in which both women and men are playing in the same ground on the same day. There's, it's not random. They don't let us like throw dice and set Sporting fixtures annoys, that annoys me. Anybody here is an RCT enthusiast? No? no? If you were an RCT enthusiast, it would annoy you too. But it's, it's close enough to random. It's arbitrary. We're saying the day in which a double header event is taking place is basically the same as the day in which a single header event is taking place. And so if we can see changes in the relative changes in the level of interest in women cricketers playing double headers, relative to single headers compared to the historical trends for those players over the previous days, we can call that a causal impact, right? We can say that's an effect of the double header event. If you don't agree with my identification strategy, take it up with me later, but not now, because we don't have time. So what do we find? In our Wikipedia data, we find large and statistically significant effects of double header events on interest in women cricketers, i.e. the extent that people are going to the Wikipedia page of it. It's about 20%, 27% uptick. It's statistically significant. It's robust to all of the different statistical toys I can throw at it. For Google data, the story is a little bit less cheerful. So the effect is still statistically significant at conventional levels, but it is small, more in the region of 3 or 4% increase. I don't have a good story as to why these effects are so different in size, but they are both in the right direction, and they are statistically significant. So I think we conclude that double header events do seem to drive more interest in women's cricket than single header events. Now, there's a question about does this need to continue forever? Like, once people have got hooked on women's cricket, can we separate the two out again? Very possibly yes. My data doesn't run into the future because, unfortunately, in order to make your data run into the future, you have to commit research fraud, and then they fire you, and it's very awkward. And also, you get easily caught if you make up data from 2027. Um, so I don't know, but good question. So the next question is, what next? And this is where I'm going to ask for your help if any of you are interested in cricket at all, which you may not be, in which case, thanks for listening. Um, so what we want to do is test the use of a new format of cricket in which you have a single, rather than having two games, men's and women's, you have a single game with a male side and a female side on both sides. So women are only playing against women, men are only playing against men, but every run counts towards winning the same match. So a run by a female cricketer has the same value winning the match as a run by a male cricketer, and it's the same game. So if you believe, hypothetically, that women's cricket is less well optimized than men's cricket, which you would believe if you believe that money made a difference to how optimized sports are, then it makes sense to divert money towards the women's game in order to 
get the best marginal impact. And it's interleavened, which means that you cannot just turn up for the men's bit of it and then go home and miss the women's bit of it, because the men's bit and the women's bit are one after the other in sequence. Um, so we want to test this out. The first thing we want to do is find some grassroots cricket teams to, to actually play this and see if it works as a thing. And if it does work as a thing, then we'll try and do it more. If you happen to have a grassroots cricket team or like to form one in the next half an hour or so, <laughs> then we will make it, if you, if you take part in this, we will make a £2,000 donation to a charity of your choice. As long as it's not one I disagree with politically. <laughs> Subject to constraints. So that's the research, that's our ask, and that is me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. And so now I think the rest of our speakers are going to move to sit on the stage. And we're going to hand over to Dr. Kate Bancroft to speak first. But we want to make our way onto the stage. Hi everybody, thank you for coming. I um, just wanted to begin by thanking the panel that are coming. I have known everyone personally that's come today, apart from Lisa, who we've, I've had the pleasure of meeting through organising this event. So I just wanted to say thank you to my friends and colleagues for coming and hosting, uh, help hosting today. I really appreciate it. Um, so just a bit about me. So um, I trained to be a PE teacher in 2005, which feels like a lifetime ago. Um, I spent seven years PE teaching in Leeds and Bradford, which you can probably tell with my accent, because I feel like a fish out of water in London, <laughs> getting lost every day on the tube and realising that I sound very different to everybody else down here. Um, but I have spent my life as an adult passionate, deeply passionate about sport, deeply as a women's PE teacher, deeply passionate about women having a fairer, uh, young girls, sorry, having an equal experience to men in PE. Um, I did my undergrad dissertation on it, um, began a master's programme looking at this and then transferred onto a PhD programme where I spent five years um, looking at the experiences of women in the workplace um, and really feel really, really deeply passionate now as I've got evolved as an academic on researching women's equality in sports, um, sorry, male dominated sports workplaces. That's a bit of a mouthful. So over the last two years, um, I've been specialising particularly on Formula One, which I live and breathe it. My family are listening online and they will know that I'm very antisocial on F1 race weekends and they get given slots in which we can hang out. Like literally like four hours here, but then I need to go. Two hours here, but then I need to go. <laughs> so sorry about that family if you're listening. Um, but yeah, this has taken over my life, my love for motorsport, racing, and most importantly, making sure that no woman that works in it has a less fair experience than her male counterparts. And that is the hill I will die on as an adult <laughs> and academic. So I'm going to talk to you really quickly today about um, my research, one particular research project. So I've got about five underway, but the one that I want to talk to you today about is my investigations into the lived experiences of women working in engineering or technical roles in Formula One. These are women that are um, experienced in those particular roles and working in the top 10 teams in the F1 championship at the moment. So I had the pleasure of speaking to 16 different women from 16 different teams, uh, sorry, from the 10 different teams in Formula One. Um, and I've done this research with Dr. Damien Sturm, who is an academic in New Zealand. And just to quickly cover um, what I'm going to outline today, is I'm going to talk about the things that those engineers and technical, um, the women working in engineering or technical roles love about their job, what things that I foresee we need to change if we want them to thrive in their jobs and experience long, happy careers in their job and not be disadvantaged as a result of their biological sex or gender identity. And I'm going to talk about what themes have come out about what keeps them going. If you're a young woman and you're on a team full of men and all your management above you is full of men and you're the first female to ever do that role, what keeps you going when times get hard? So to begin, so in terms of what women in engineering and um, technical roles in F1 love about their job is they find it, so this is a sample of 16, so it's not massive claims, but these are the themes that were coming out of our data that we collected. They find it exhilarating. They love the people generally that they work with. 
They love learning new skills. They love the fast paced environment and the quick results of their labor, which as someone that works in academia, where when you change something like an academic paper and you have to wait for a year to find out whether it's been accepted or not, finding the results of your work on the Saturday after you've done it feels very fulfilling. <laughs> so they love the quick results of their labor. If they've created a repair on a car, for example, such as a if they're in a mechanical role or a technical role, they love knowing that they, their repair helped that car survive that race or that they kept the driver safe who's racing around at 200 miles an hour. They love working as a team with one aim. They love seeing their hard work make a car go faster. They love that their mind is always learning because they're working with technology that's brand new, completely innovative, and no one has ever worked with some of the things that they're working on before. They like the pay, the benefits, and the bonus culture. The bonus culture sounding glorious as well as someone in academia that gets no bonuses. <laughs> Um, they love the close-knit nature of working the team, the atmosphere, they love the pace of the industry, again, a very appealing working in academia, they love the broad spectrum of technologies, travelling, and someone said that they love the drama of F1. Are there any Drive to Survive fans in the house? So we know there's drama, we know there's made-up drama, but we don't care, because we love it anyway, <laughs> and it makes a great night in. In terms of the things that they have said that they need to change if they want to experience long, happy careers in the sport. And by saying this as well, I'm not saying these are things necessarily just restricted to F1 careers. These are things that are probably representative of maybe careers in football, which Brianna is going to talk about, cricket and other things. So for many of these women, they're the first people to do their roles. So therefore, there is a lack of mentoring often. They have no one who's done their position before them that is female. And when we look at that intersectionality of being female and doing that role, they are the very first person in the history of motorsport in Formula One doing that for the first time. So there's a lack of mentoring of people that have done that role before them and are female. They find the workload intense. Some women feel they have to work 10 times harder to prove themselves. There's an inability still to work from home, which often negatively impacts women or the women that I spoke to, because we know that often women carry the, more of the emotional labor or more of the childcare responsibilities traditionally, which is still the case in 2023. They find the pressure of having to pave the way exhausting often. Being the first person to do their role really takes its toll. They feel worried if they see something wrong as coming across as a nagging woman, and they often believe that men, might f if their male counterparts were delivering the same feedback, that they would be differently received. They find that emails, sometimes emails sent from the superiors will be addressed as gents at the start. A big issue for many women working in F1 is the unflattering kit that they have to wear, which I relate to as a PE teacher too having to enforce stupid, ugly PE kit rules that are so outdated. But for women having to wear baggy polo shirts, clothes that are made often with men in mind, an unflattering kit, they don't feel like themselves at the track. Periods is a massive issue for women and trans men and non-binary people working in, in the sport because if you are on day one of your period, like most women in here, um, or trans men or non-binary people can relate. If you have your period, it's very painful and you might have a day at the track arriving if you're a mechanic at 6 a.m., leaving at 8 p.m. Um, when curfew starts. So it's horrendous for a lot of women who suffer with period pain working those hours. If they're, in a, if they're at a track in the Middle East or somewhere, they can't just nip to Tesco Express to get a sanitary towel or a tampon. And often teams that have been male dominated historically haven't prepared for women in this way, but hopefully that's changing. In some teams, not all of them, the women reported that within the trackside teams and at the factories, sexual jokes or banters, banter is still tolerated. For many women as well, talking about that labor that historically women have taken on the majority of childcare responsibilities, they were really crying out for nurseries at work, especially with the inflexible rules about working from home. So to finish, for these amazing, inspiring women, I'm going to talk about what keeps them going. So these are some direct quotes from, this, from the, from the um, data collected. I believe I'm good and I deserve to progress and I understand why I'm in this role. I am passionate about inspiring the next generation. I love the confidence of knowing what I, that I am good at what I do. I love the feeling of making something better or making a system more eco-friendly. I love seeing the hard work make results instantly at the track. I love something I can relate to, not that there's any negative parts of my job at all, to my boss, Michael. <laughs> they said they love reaching out to friends in the industry and venting. When I started, someone said, when I started, I saw five women at the track that were women, uh, sorry, wives and girlfriends of the drivers. Look at it now, she said. She said, if I give up, STEM won't change in the sport. 
I want to leave F1 better than how I found it. And the last quote from this part, being an example to women drives me to succeed through the hardest times. Now, anyone that knows me closely knows I've become a little bit obsessed with studying the Stoics, which is very weird and off-brand for me, and I don't know where this has come from. But some of you might have heard of Ryan Holiday, who um, talks about Stoicism in modern terms. And one thing he talks about in the context of self-development is my favourite quote from him. One thing a day adds up, each day adds up, but the numbers are only interesting if they accumulate in large quantities. So there's a lot of great stuff happening. There's a lot of little things that aren't really little things, but in the big spectrum of things, they are little things. If we can make these changes to little things, team by team in F1 and in the F1 Academy, it is going to be interesting to see over the next few years how all those changes in little pockets add up and accumulate in large quantities to make a fairer landscape for women who want to work in the sport and love their jobs and experience long, happy careers. So sorry that's been a whirlwind. Grab me at the end if you want to discuss any more, but that is it for now. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kate. And I'm going to invite Brianna Harding to make her comments. She's head of HR at Crystal Palace Football Club. Over to you, Brianna. Aim this way. Hi, everyone. Lovely to be here. Um, I'm Bree, head of HR of Crystal Palace. I'll address the elephant in the room. I am very young. I am the youngest head of HR in the Premier League and probably in sport. Um, I come from the world of, of Formula One, but I won't steal Tommy's spotlight on that. Um, I'm now working in the world of football at Crystal Palace Football Club, and they both have really common themes. So they're both historically male-dominated, um, with boys' club reputations behind them. They're both actively trying to grow diverse staff bases and diverse fan bases. Um, investing in female drivers and women's football, but they're both experiencing similar challenges with that cultural change. So I picked up a couple um, of issues to raise today um, that I've personally worked on. The first, and it seems really simple, but it's not, facilities. These stadiums, these um, places of work were built with men in mind for either male athletes or male colleagues. And the issue comes of bathrooms. Seems really simple, let's just put a female toilet in. There's never enough, it's never in the right place, it's often next to a uh, working space where you can hear something going on, if it's your time of the month, you're trying to open something, really, really awkward. Uh, it seems like an easy solution, definitely not the case, and I don't know why uh, they didn't anticipate the female inclusion later down the line, but it's certainly an issue we're still, still facing. Another is terminology, and Kate touched on it, but looking at when you're discussing a new colleague coming in, you often hear, he will, he will sit here. We need to get him a laptop. This is what he will be doing, uh, rather than using that gender neutral language. Dear gents on email chains, um, I, won't, I won't rant on on that, but I could for hours. Um, referring to boys, fellas, chaps, didn't they do a really good job today? What about everybody else? There's some really great gender neutral terms out there. How about team? How about club? And then moving towards, like I said, the gender neutral language and getting that into a habit, moving away from something that we've, we've become so accustomed to or they've become so accustomed to and really acknowledging the impact that that has on your female colleagues that might be in that email chain that says, dear gents. Another is kit, uniform, office wear, making sure that options are inclusive of a gender, body shape, menopause appropriate, ensuring that our women's wear offering in sport isn't just the pink version of what we provide to men. Um, <laughs> making sure that within football we're looking at the white shorts and in all sports we're looking at white shorts especially when it comes to girls and I don't know who made the decision to bring that in but I think that highlights the importance of having a diverse um, management team in the room who are those decision makers are we considering all angles how did we even get to this point where we're now trying to reverse it and change that microaggressions Women are more likely to be mistaken for junior roles. Um, ad hoc comments are made about appearance and emotion. We're blending in. We're toning down. We're having discussions and curating these professional appearances and spending a lot of time into how we look and how we show up and what we might have on our agenda that day to make sure we come across in the right way. Um, now, it's quite funny because whenever I'm introduced to somebody new, uh, my partner's very proud of what I do, and he says, you know, she works for Crystal Palace, she works in football, and the immediate response is, ah, oh, do you work in marketing? And I'm sort of, no, I work in the other very gender typical um, department, I'm in HR. But actually now I've come to say, I'm actually head of analysis. I'm an under 10 scout. 
I work for the first team in coaching, I'm a physio, and sort of see that look on their face change and think, actually, maybe they won't question somebody next time when they ask what they do in a sport that they perhaps don't anticipate. So what can we do about it and what have I done about it? Data. If Formula One taught me nothing, it's, it's get the data. Ask the hard questions, tackle them head on. Have you experienced discrimination here? Have you observed banter or perceived banter here? And then what are we going to do about it? And another example I can give is that when we gave out one of these surveys in a, in a previous employment, uh, a comment was made off the back of it and it said, there are no issues, you're creating issues as if I'm spending my evenings, my weekends, my additional time with my colleagues trying to create these issues. Um, and I think what a naive world to be working in, but what an important message for us when we're looking at this data and we're sharing it with our colleagues to get them on as allies. These are the problems. You know, you've told us that's what it is. This is the data here. And this is how you can be part of that solution. Looking at psychologically safe spaces and not underestimating the power that they have looking at mentorship, allyship, EDI groups, women networks, forums, just connecting people on a social level and allowing them to get these things off their chest. But not just that, turning these conversations into actions, showing that as an organization or as an individual hearing these comments, that we can make a difference. And then using International Women's Day, Women in Engineering, Menopause Awareness Month as springboards to boost our initiatives, launch new initiatives, discuss our progress, but remembering that inclusion is all year round and this is just a part of it. And then lastly, representation. If you can see it, you can be it. And it's not just showcasing your female staff on socials, but engaging with the under talent, putting in long-term investment into the future of women in sport. Now for Crystal Palace, we're investing into an emerging talent center. So that's getting young girls into the football backed by a Premier League club. Uh, we're exploring an academy to create that pathway into the professional league, into our women's team. But we're also investing in our women's team, looking at coaching and nutrition around the menstrual cycle. And there's some absolutely fantastic science around that and how we can really help our players be the best that they can be with all of that backing. So for me, it's not girls can, it's anyone can, because hard work has no gender, passion has no gender, and football shouldn't have a gender. Thank you so much, Brianna. And now we're going to hear from Tommy Hughes, who's a PhD student at the University of Bath and People Performance Manager at Mercedes AMG Ooh. High Performance Powertrains. That's right, I get it wrong every time, don't worry. <laughs> um, firstly, um, it's fantastic to be here and it's great to see so many of you attending such an important topic as well. So um, thanks everybody for attending as well. So I appreciate not everybody would have heard of Mercedes AMG HPP. Um, so Mercedes AMG is one half of Mercedes Formula One team. It's, we're split into two. Um, are, are there many Formula One fans in the room? I know there's a couple for... There's a few. So sometimes at the end of the race, you might see Lewis say thanks to everyone at both factories at Brixworth and at Brackley. I'm at the Brixworth one as well. So there's about 1,200 people uh, at Brixworth and 1,200 as well at Brackley. So 2,400 people to make some cars go round in circles. <laughs> Crazy, huh? <laughs> but there are other things that we do at Bricksworth as well. So we've created the um, the X1, the Project One car as well, which is a two and a half million pound supercar, which is based on the 2015 um, F1 car as well. So about two and a half million pounds each. But if anybody would like to put a deposit on one after this as well, I do take <laughs> cash as well. So that's okay. And also we're looking at EQXX as well, which is the first EV car to do 1,000 kilometers on a single charge EV as well. So a lot of people ask what sort of technology goes from the, the Formula One into, into, into road cars, and, and that's one of those areas as well. So what's my role within um, the world of Formula One? Formula One is a very demanding, it's very time sensitive. I think a lot of people talk about um, deadlines and targets and certain things, but for us, the race is at Sunday at two o'clock. If you're ready or not, the, the, race, will, the race will go ahead. So the, the, it's a very demanding environment. But my job is to optimize the human performance of all of our staff so that they can thrive within that environment as well, which is massively important. Now, it's no secret that not only for Mercedes, but the whole world of Formula One is massively male dominated environment. And I think there's some currently some great work that's happening in order to, to, to make some of those changes as well. But I always find it interesting when we start talking about these topics that we only ever really talk about 
what the what, what the women need to do, what the women how do, what's the training that we need to put on stuff like that. For me, I actually think it's probably seventy percent the other way in terms of what what do the men need to do, what do the men need to be more self aware of, what changes do the men have to do, it, rather than what are the women looking at, which I think is far more important. So in terms of my um, role, I look at it from several different aspects. Um, I look at from the nutrition, so we feed the team as well. We feed, we make sure we feed them the best possible food, so they're performing at their optimal level. Um, the physical health as well, so we have a performance center on site, which looks at a variety of different aspects as well. Um, I know that Brianna was talking about um, different EDID groups and education as well. So again, being in a male, very male-dominated environment, the topics around menopause maybe six years ago was something that was like a, a, a taboo topic and nobody really wanted to talk about it. Whereas now it's, it's, it's commonplace and it's good to see that we have adverts up for everything and we're now promoting those sort of things and making it um, the, the norm in the business, which is, which is, which is fantastic to see. So I also look after the well-being and mental health of the team as well, ensuring that everyone is well supported. And now we've also created a thriving program, which is based on my PhD, which looks at human thriving, which is looking at optimal levels of not only well-being, but performance as well. A lot of people have really high levels of performance, but low levels of well-being, ultimately burning out and then leaving. So we're now looking at how can we sustain those high levels of well-being, high levels of performance. And we're now even looking at it in terms of um, gender as well to see if there's particular things that we could do to support from the different aspects as well, which is really fascinating in terms of how people cope with, with stress and how we can support them thrive in really challenging environments, which Formula One is. Um, and also how people um, appraise those challenges uh, as well, whether they see it as a challenge or whether they see it as a threat uh, as well. So. Um, that's really all I have to say. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A at the end, and I hope there's some, um, some good questions, and I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Another guest was a woman named Jacqueline Comer, who was the co-founder of a tech company in New Zealand, and they're currently using artificial intelligence to combat and mitigate online abuse in various industries, particularly sports. I feel very fortunate to have had many experiences like these, where I got to gain many points of reference, immense inspiration, and the confidence to take the next step in my life and in my career. And I think the fact that you're all here is a testament to the value of this idea of the exchange. You recognize that there's value in connecting and sharing and listening. And I believe that it's in our collective best interest to continue to exchange what we know, what we're passionate about, and what we're working on, and ultimately create more meaningful moments like this one tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sabrina. And last but by no means least, we'll hear from Lisa West, who's Head of Policy and Partnerships and Public Affairs at Women in Sport. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you very much, Rosie, and thanks so much for having me here. Um, it's, I'm so fascinating um, listening to everybody speak already. Um, and I suppose uh, from the charity where I work, Women in Sport, um, what we've been looking at, uh, particularly ahead of our 40th anniversary next year, is the history of women's sport. And I think it's really important to sort of root, I suppose, everything that, that we know now in, in that history and understand why, why we are where we are and, and how, we, how we seek to, to change it for the future. Um, and you don't have to look too far back, really, to, to see active exclusion from women in sport, whether it's the football ban from 1921 to 71, um, the fact that women were only allowed to take part in the Olympic marathon in 1984. Um, so there's our 40-year anniversary um, along with us next year. Um, it was 2000 before women were allowed to take part in the pole vault at the Olympic Games, and it was 2014 before women were allowed to ski jump at the Winter Olympics. So this is really recent history. Um, and when we think about it from a, we've talked quite a lot about sort of in the workplace and in governance, um, it was 2016 before UK Sport introduced a, um, a quota around women on boards um, in sports governing bodies. Um, that was actually only 30%. So we were, we were targeting just to be a little bit bad, not really bad. Um, so this is all really, really recent stuff. And there's a couple of points that, are, that I'm going to um, cover. The first is around representation. We've heard quite a lot about it already, but it is absolutely vital that we've got women's voices in the rooms, in the rooms that we're making decisions about the future of sport, particularly about the future of women's sport. Um, at the moment, um, if you take the, the big um, sort of participation sports, um, about 23% of those top roles of chair, CEO, performance director are held by women. So less than a quarter in those big decision-making roles. Um, quite a lot of sports will um, proudly tell us um, that their, their uh, gender equality across their board is pretty good. But when you look at where those women are, it's very often in HR, it's very often in safeguarding, it's not in those decision-making roles. And that's a real cultural shift we've got to make. Um, University of Portsmouth actually did a, um, a study last year um, looking at football and two thirds of the clubs in the top four professional men's games are still have men only boards um, and seven out of 12 of the WSL have men only boards. Um, so we just don't have women in the room yet. And we need to make that change. And we talked as well, of course, about the experiences as well. So we may well have rooms where we have women, but actually their experience is so miserable some of the time, as you've alluded to, Kate. Um, this inherent misogyny that still sits through a lot of our sports organisations um, is driving policy and practice. Um, and unless we're really unpicking that and we're really challenging that, um, we're not going to get the change that we want to see. This year particularly, we have focused quite a lot on um, younger um, girls. We've been focusing around primary age girls, um, a topic that's been absolutely fascinating for me as the parent of an eight-year-old daughter and a four-year-old son. Um, so I've loved all of the research we've done into this. Um, and what we found through the year is that uh, gender stereotyping is absolutely still alive and kicking um, and is really, really affecting our girls' uh, enjoyment um, and ability to fall in love with sport and physical activity. Um, and this plays out throughout their lives. So I'm going to concentrate a little bit about primary, um, the primary age. Um, but of course, this plays out. And we see, as we get right through up into to midlife, the way that that um, affects women in midlife. So the stereotyping that happens at such a young age um, affects the way that women prioritize themselves, prioritize their time, um, the number of caring responsibilities they have, and that free time that we see this sort of five hours less a week of time that women have in midlife. And it all stems from this stereotyping happening at such a young age. So what we found was, although we were um, sort of focusing on primary age girls, a lot of the 
damage, I'm going to say it, has been done before kids even get to school. So stereotyping happens from the moment kids are born. Um, and the way that it plays out in, when it comes to sport and physical activity is that kids are coming into school, girls are coming into school less able to kick a ball, throw a ball, hit a ball with a bat than their male counterparts, simply because of the experiences they've had to the point that they even arrive in school. And what we know is that there's a real, real lack of value. Um, so it's evident in the way that um, sort of parents are um, engaging with their girls compared to their boys at that very young age, and we see it through school as well. But there's lack of value that's placed on um, girls participating in sport. Um, parents actually told us, so 30% of parents believe that sport's really important to their girls. 41% of parents believe it's really important to their boys. So there's big, big differences um, in, in uh, how parents view this. 69% uh, of parents said that rugby is not appropriate for their daughters. Um, so, you know, if we're, if we're starting to believe that we're living in a world where, um, where don't worry, the next generation have got it all sorted, um, there is an awful lot still going into kids coming through today. Um, and as I said, I see it in my own children on a daily basis. I have to challenge them on things that they say that they've picked up from school that I just can't believe that, you know, that they're hearing and saying. And will believe if they're not called out on it. Um, we know there's um, significantly fewer girls that take part in out-of-school activity um, through primary age. Um, so lots of boys going out, mostly football. It is largely driven by football, um, going out and playing football, and girls are just not accessing that the same. Um, and what we see is leads to this absolute sort of mass exodus from sport um, as girls reach that sort of transition between primary and secondary school. So we see 43% of girls disengaging with sport at that stage in their lives. Um, I think in the past it's kind of been, oh, once puberty comes along, girls just drop out. But the damage is done. <laughs> you know, we're doing the damage before that. The fact that we still don't understand um, enough uh, about female biology to really support girls through that, that um, phase of staying active during puberty is by the by, because we've lost them before we've even got there. So we've got to address this early. Um, so through our 40th anniversary next year, I'm just going to see how many plugs I can actually get in for the fact it's our 40th anniversary year. And I should say, actually, that lovely um, offer of the uh, charity donation, I'd like to just put my hand up and say if anyone has their cricket team and wants to donate, then Women's Sport would uh, very gratefully receive that donation. Um, but through our 40th anniversary year next year, we are going to be um, really, really prioritizing how we um, smash these stereotypes, how we raise the awareness of the fact that this is something we still got to fight on a daily basis, um, how we help teachers and coaches understand how they um, deal with the, the stereotyping that's in front of them and how they challenge and call out behavior that it's just, it's just not helping our girls to thrive in sport. Um, I will leave it there. I could go on all day. Um, and please do, yeah, if you've got any questions at the end, please come and find me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Such wonderful contributions, and my mind was popping with lots of things. An article I read last week, an area of research I didn't know much about, um, was looking about the kind of myth of the men as the hunter and the woman as the gatherer, and the fact that women were always hunters. They hunted pregnant. And of course, we know now that women can have incredible endurance over very long distance kind of sports. And that endurance was very, very important for hunting animals, you know, because the the way we tended to wear animals down was by just following them for a really long time. And women had that resilience and determination. And of course, estrogen turns out to be a really important factor in terms of muscle development and sport prowess. And yet we know so little about it. So I really was thinking about what you were saying then. Um, and then I couldn't help but think, uh, as, as Tommy was talking about um, not fixing the women at the Global Institute for Women's Leadership, that is our mantra. We want to fix systems so they're inclusive for everybody, not women. And then all of you were making me think about how absolutely critical it is to have diverse voices in um, decision making, but also to have inclusive environments. And I don't know if many of you are following the COVID inquiry, but the parallels when we think about uniforms, when we think about the ill-fitting PPE, you know, 70% of healthcare workers are women, and yet they were not safely protected because the, the PPE didn't fit. The parallels with sport. Um, are just phenomenal. So what I'm going to do is, rather than me take up the time by asking lots of questions, I know there are lots of sporting experts in the audience, so I would rather we heard from your questions. So what we'll do is we'll take them in batches of three. We've got some roving microphones. So if you could pop your hands up, I'll take three questions and field them to the audience. We've got one here. And it, two more hands. One at the back and one at the side there. Lovely. Do you want to say who you are first? Hi, my name's, oh, sorry, hi, my name's Isabel. That was 
super inspirational and just very interesting. So thank you so much for being with. Um, I'm passionate about cheerleading and I've been in cheerleading for the last 10 years and I'm lucky enough to coach a small grassroots team in Clapham. Um, I'm really proud and passionate that I think it's a male, female dominant sport um, and that they grow real levels of resilience and leadership through the time they spend in our gym. Recently, I was in an interview and I was talking quite animatedly about cheerleading and what I've learned from it. And um, I said to them, you should, you should watch it at some point and see the level it's at. And they said to me, oh, we wouldn't want to watch that in the office. And so my question to you is we focus predominantly today on male dominated sports and increasing representation from females. What about female dominated sports and how we change the stereotype? And I think, Lisa, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. OK, thank you so much. Um, second question was um, lovely. Thank you. There is a mic on the chair there. So there, were, there was definitely you and there was a green jumper as well. So um, there were definitely two questions. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Hi, um, my name's Gemma. I work at King's. I'm not in any way a sports expert, um, but I have a little boy who's 10 and very passionate about cricket, and my partner is as well. And sorry, it's another one for Lisa, but um, I'm just really interested to hear your point about the damage is already done by the time the kids are at school. Now, I was brought up in the 80s. My dad, I had an older brother, and my dad was so... Um, he was so diligent about teaching me how to throw and catch and teaching me just the same as my brother but I got to school and it all stopped um not at home but at school there was nothing for me at school and I'm just interested to know even if you think the damage is done when you get to school you know are you seeing a better investment in primary schools in um sports for girls thank you very much hi my name is Caroline thank you so much great great uh, comments from everyone my question is about the landscape of advocacy and the landscape for kind of progress and change in the UK. Do you think there's enough happening? Does there need to be more from clubs and other sport organisations? What about from government and other players? Is there enough happening and, and, and what more do you think needs to happen? Wonderful. Thank you so much. So we've, the first two questions are directed specifically at you, Lisa. So do you want to take those? That was on stereotypes in women-dominated sport and whether schools are investing enough in girls. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm a netball player, so <laughs> all about the female dominated sport. Um, and actually, it's been really interesting working with um, netball. I don't know whether you've seen anything that they've done. Um, they've been working with um, a company called The Well HQ on Netball Her, which is um, basically recognising the fact that women have a lot of needs that have not been recognised in sport and physical activity. And netball is saying we are here for women and we are going to be the first to truly understand what it is that women need in sport um they you know from simple things i say simple but you know it, it's a bit revolutionary really i suppose of making sure that all of the red roses have got properly fitting bras you know just those kinds of things that are, are still just not happening in most sports so i think netball is a brilliant one for showing what a female dominated sport can do to, to sort of be loud and proud about the fact that um it's completely a safe space where women are understood and their needs are understood um, and yeah kind of bonkers actually for um, I'm not supposed to use the word bonkers but it is bonkers that um, a women's sport hasn't done that in the past that you know women's sport has been ignoring women as much as the male dominated sports um, have but I think that's changing fast so um, and I imagine there's probably a lot of that in, in cheerleading as well of actually recognizing and moving very quickly because you haven't got the um, well because we've got voices at the top for starters that can make these changes very quickly. Um, and then it was um, schools, are they investing enough in yes. girls' sport? Yeah, sorry, I made that sound very miserable, didn't I? It's all done. There's no point if they haven't sorted it by the time they're four and a half. Um, no, I don't believe that. Um, I think there, there is lots of good work going on in school, without a doubt. Um, there is... So I'm a governor at my, my kids' school as well. Um, so I have been working with the school and understanding what change can be made in schools and actually there is so much good stuff happening there is a lot of um there's a lot of expectation that girls and boys do the same um which is good 
Um, in most cases, um, we must recognise there are differences, but at primary school on the whole, it's okay to say actually girls and boys should be treated the same when it comes to sport and physical activity. Um, the government announcement in March made that possible. Um, they made a big announcement there was um, which touched on your question a little bit as well um they announced it in terms of the amount of investment that was made it was slightly badged up beautifully on international women's day that all of that investment sounded like it was going into um, girls uh, it didn't all go into girls it went into school um, but the one thing that they really did say was we cannot have boys play football and girls play netball anymore that just can't be um i think the um awareness is there is getting there with teachers. I think we need to do some more work. I think our biggest challenge at primary school is that so many of the teachers are women um, and we know about the experiences of PE. We touched on that, our own experiences of PE. Um, also growing up in the 80s, my experiences of PE were uh, less than fun, even though I loved sport. Um, so we've got some barriers to overcome to get past people who've perhaps had negative experiences and trying to help them understand how to give the kids they're now teaching a positive experience um so still work to do but definitely positive but yeah need more out of school we need more girls taking part out of school rather than just in school because that's when it drops away thank you lisa and then we had a question about whether more needs to be done with advocacy does anyone else on the panel want to take that I, could could we ask you whoever asked that question to to say it again because i just could Caroline. not hear it and i'm happy to answer it <laughs> Sorry, Caroline. Yes, of course. I, I asked, uh, how do you view the, the landscape around advocacy for increasing participation of women in sport? Do you think clubs need to be doing more? Does government need to be doing more? You know, is there an, are there enough voices and we're on the right trajectory or, or more needs to be happening? Yeah, I think um, I'm not an expert in this at all. But from my own personal experience as a woman, I think we've seen a bit more strictness maybe in government legislation around sexual harassment so if you're a woman in here and you're going to do exercise outside you're probably likely to feel unsafe at times something me and colleagues are talking about today probably be wolf whistled at probably be haggled and i think the government is moving towards the point of including that kind of harassment as illegal i ran the london marathon this year and i ran another just casually dropping this i ran another half marathon that i filled in very last minute for someone and there was loads of men videoing that weren't official photographers and it became apparent that people attend marathons film women running make montages of I won't go into much detail you can probably guess and there's no 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 one stopping that it's just allowed and it's very off-putting and horrible to think where footage of you in that state might be and so I don't think there is enough advocacy for women's safety in sport but i am not educated enough in this to talk about it from an academic perspective but from a lived experience and from talking to female colleagues even today about this i think there needs to be much more more work there's some horrible academic papers about how much women are harassed when exercising outside in parks and things so i don't think enough's being done i think the government needs to do more um does anyone else have <laughs> all i can talk about is what's happened to me as a woman and not really from an educated place but <laughs> yeah I was going to say, in terms of what's 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 happening in terms of Formula One, I think there is a lot happening in terms of F1 Academy, and I think there's a lot of work that's going down now um, to uh, increase representation of women. Um, I think one of the things, especially in terms of Formula One, and particularly with engineers, I think what we ha what we have to do though is is go much earlier in that career path as well, because in terms of getting the education to be qualified in terms of Formula One, we're talking 10, 11, 12 years. So we need to be getting people excited and women excited, young girls excited about Formula One from a much younger age and actually having them see it as a, as a viable option. But in order for us to be able to do that, we need to be, like we talked about before, in terms of role models. So we have um, Lewis's power unit engineer is, is a woman and she's an absolute trailblazer in terms of um, women within F1 engineering and her, getting her to go to the schools and doing more in terms of having somebody they, they can look at and say, um, Holly's done it, I can do it as well. And I think that's where the industry needs to do more to support the schools to start off um, much earlier in that process of, uh, of having that next generation uh, of leading engineers, which I think is my, my opinion. Yeah, and just yeah. one other thing that I just thought of was, Tommy and me were talking about earlier, that if you want to be a young girl and love Premier League women's football or the Women's Super League, you might not have a Sky Sports subscription. Mm -hmm. So there's a real social class issue of accessibility here, especially with Formula One, where 
again, he's stuck behind a Sky Sports subscription or a Now TV subscription or an F1 TV subscription, which children obviously can't afford. So I think there's a lot of social class issues which need a lot more work and advocacy. And it should not be the responsibility of women to do that if we're talking about it from a gender sort of lens and perspective. I hope that answers it. <laughs> so um, we've got room for another round of questions, I think. So I, I can see one hand there. Oh, we've got quite a few. Excellent. So I think... Uh -huh. Let's just take them all, and then that'll be the last lot. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six in total, which is quite a lot. Sorry, everyone. We'll do it in two rounds of three. So we'll take the three closest to the top first. If you can keep them short so we don't overrun. Thank you. Uh, hi. Thanks very much for this evening. I, I work in sports medicine, so delivering services into players and things. And um, my question is really, how do we stop the scenario where women work with women's teams or sit on women's boards and the men work with the men's teams and sit on the men's boards. That's lovely. Thank you. What was your name? Uh, it's Claire. Claire Smith. And I think there was a, a lady in the white behind you there. Yeah. Hi, uh, Lona. I work in sports marketing. Um, just to be honest, comment earlier, but it's, yeah, working in sports marketing. And um, my question was I, I kind of two-pronged really, but um, we've seen obviously backlash recently when Arsenal Women's posted their team squad photo in terms of participation and diversity in sport and obviously com in contrast to the men's. And I'm just wondering, you know, what, what do you view as the kind of root um, issues that obviously, the, you know, women, women's participation is rising, but in terms of targeting um, diverse backgrounds, bringing that up and, you know, into WSL and having that reflect, because I think, the NWSL in the States has the same thing and it's a socioeconomic issue. Thank you. And I think there was another question just further along. Yes, do you want to pass the microphone on? So we'll take these three and then we'll uh, take the last three. Oh Yes, uh, hello. First, sorry for my English. Uh, I'm a French student and uh, I just was wondering about when, for example, Lisa, uh, you're um, an HR and uh, I was wondering if you had to uh, have... A, when, when you were faced with a situation of discrimination or sexual assault, uh, I mean, I have experienced such experience, uh, such situation where I had to defend my defend myself where against a male par uh, other party, and it was a female teacher that had to solve it, and behind closed doors, basically, it was because she was a female teacher, uh, she was biased, so. You, as a female uh, HR, uh, have do you have a solution for male groups that may think, well, it's a female, she's going to be biased anyway. So do you have a and larger what, solution? And what was your name? Uh, Chloe, sorry. Chloe, <laughs> okay, so we've got, we've, got three, we've got three questions here. We've got one about, you know, how do we break down from Trey about women working for women's teams, men with men's teams. We've got one for Lona about the backlash and how you can actually target um, people from marginalized backgrounds, I think that's what you were saying. And then we've got Chloe on actually um, sometimes if you have, if you're going to complain of experience of discrimination to another woman, that might not be taken seriously. Does anyone on the panel want to answer any of those? You can pick one, you pick a couple. <laughs> I can give a couple of thoughts on the first yeah. two. That's right. Um, I think um, it's such an interesting question, isn't it? Um, and I think a lot of it probably stems still in this inherent misogyny that we talk about, that um, in a lot of cases there's, well, women can't work in the men's game because you need to be in the men's game to work in the men's game, um, but it's okay for men to work in the women's game. Um, so I think we've got big issues there that are cultural issues that we still haven't solved yet. Um, there's other, um, it, it's interesting actually over in the States because um, women's soccer, and sorry if there's, um, I'm sure there are um, people in the States in the audience who will know this um, better than I do, but um, because soccer of course for women is, is such a higher level than men, it's actually more, um, it's got more kudos to work in women's soccer than it is in men's soccer. Um, so there's a bit about that reputation piece that I think hopefully as the level of women's sport rises and as um, women's sport is perceived, um, which it is, but as the perception gets that it is as good as the men's, if you like, I think there will be a natural um, cross that will happen more so. Um, but I think it's this, this issue we still have of, um, well, women can only work in women's sport and that stems from 
bad culture. Thank you very much. Does anyone else want to take a pick up any of the others? Yeah? I, I was only really going to add on the first one, really, as well. I think um, Formula One's in a fantastic position to actually change some of those things as well. I think, again, talking about um, the F1 Academy, which is starting this year with Susie Wolf um, and having so many fantastic female uh, F1 drivers. I think that's the beginning of a change that we'll see uh, and hopefully seeing um, some female representation in, in, in Formula One soon as well. So, again, I think it will be um, potentially slower than I'd like in terms of, uh, of, of that change. But I think it's hopefully something for the future as well. For sure. Maybe I'll just say something about points two and three. Um, I think with, it, with your point about people diversity more broadly is I think a lot of the same issues apply around being able to see role models, um, removing stereotypes, and really actively trying to recruit people. Because I think the research around gender equality and feeling like you fit in um, applies across um, underrepresented groups. And one of the things is if people think that an organisation or a sector is not it's not going to be welcoming, we don't tend to apply. So you therefore need to actually actively recruit and seek people and encourage them to apply. So I think the same kind of logics. And then this question of if you're, you know, this issue of HR is seen to be um, women dominated and therefore if you take a complaint to HR, it's not going to be taken seriously. The way that that's dealt with in organisations that handle those kind of complaints effectively is senior leadership have to be seen to take it seriously. And if they don't, you can have all the policies in the world and it just doesn't matter because the culture is so important. So I think, you know, whatever industry, whatever sector you're in, you need that leadership. There's, we have got, we will not tolerate this kind of behaviour. There's also other research that my colleague um, Rose Cook has um, done for the Behavioural Insights, I'm sorry, for the Business and Community um, Charity that kind of shows that you shouldn't have very individualised complaints processes because then you can end up having a situation where the complainant feels very um, sort of targeted and isolated. And actually, you need to have ways of, of anonymous complaints. You need to have ways of collective complaints as well. Um, so I think we had three more. We had three more questions. Yes. Um, hand very straight at the back and these two. And then I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, hi, could you say who you are first? Oh, hi. Um, I'm Nadine and I'm a student at King's College. Um, I think this might be for you, Brianna. Um, I've got a daughter who plays football and she used to play for a mixed team. And I was just wondering if you thought that sometimes trying to promote the girls' sport is sometimes passive aggressive for the like little boys. So, for example, um, she, <laughs> the coach told the boys once that if the girls scored, they got three points, but the boys only got one. And then there was another example when they were the guard of honour for the local football team and the girls got to do the guard of honour, but the boys didn't. And I was just wondering, do you think that sometimes, like promoting the sport for girls, can maybe turn the boys against them in that generation? I'm just thinking generational, um, I'd like to see change, but the way that it's sometimes done isn't that great. <laughs> Thank you, Nadine. And there was a, a question behind you, directly behind you. Yeah. Hi, um, uh, my name's Maria. I work for an organisation that delivers workshops in schools on gender inequality, gender-based violence. And, you know, we get to work with a lot of staff, a lot of pupils, but something that is always trickier is engaging with the parents. And so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on how we can get parents more involved and more passionate about this subject and really understand things that they can do, like things that are actionable um, and not put all of the pressure on schools and teachers because they already have so much pressure to deliver so much of this education in all of these areas, you know, and how can this be happening at home and, and sort of bridge that connection between school and parent community? Thank you, Maria. And there was a question at the back. You've got a mic, great. I do, thank you. My name is Siobhan. Um, we've heard um, how social conditioning affects how girls um, engage in sports and it kind of acts as a barrier uh, to girls even before they start school and they get less encouragement and, uh, and support uh, when they go forward. Therefore, if any girl who does uh, want to participate um, as, and wants to compete at a high level is going to have a fair chance to do so, she's going to need ongoing support and encouragement. So how worried should we be with the influx of high-profile biological men into women's sports 
where they typically take the podium as a result of their physical advantages. So we've got three questions. Um, first of all, we've got Nadine about um, you know, whether sometimes promoting girls' sport might turn boys against. Um, we've got Maria, who's talking about how to engage parents. And then we've got Siobhan, who's talking about women's sport. Um, anyone want to take any one of those questions? Take the first one, sure. Yeah. Um, so you're absolutely, I think, correct. There is definitely an impact and managing that can be very tricky. You know, like I said before, we, we built these facilities, we built our academy for our boys uh, based on creating a pathway for our male athletes. And we're having to send the message that you're now going to share this space, you're going to share your schedule, you know, bringing on the girls. And it's, again, comes back to leadership and how that message is sent also acknowledging and bringing in the boys within that, bringing in our you know, male colleagues and our allies within those conversations. And I think sometimes that can be um, misconstrued or the message isn't always as we want it to be and doesn't always come across the right way for those younger athletes. Um, and it's, it's definitely acknowledging the impact that's going to have on them, how you can make up for it. So you want to lift up the girls that are coming into this and you acknowledge that the platform was never equal to start with, but also you want to bring them into that conversation. You can't leave them out. You can't um, sort of ignore the success that they're also bringing, but the impact that sharing their space is going to have as well. It's a really difficult, difficult dynamic to manage, especially as we're still sharing sites. You know, our, our women's team train on the same site as our academy players. So we're experiencing that exact thing. And how do we um, acknowledge that we've created this space for the men and it's now no longer that and bring them on our journey with the club into this beautiful space where we are one team, we are one club. Our success is absolutely shared. You know, when our women succeed, our men succeed and we all succeed together. And sometimes, you know, that's really good to say and it sounds like a brilliant marketing piece, but actually when it drills down to the day to day and what that schedule looks like, sometimes, yes, the, do, the boys do look like they're missing out on time because they're now having to share that. And it just comes back to leadership and that message. And if their coaches are saying this is really positive, they're going to believe that's really positive. And just making sure you're not leaving them out of that conversation. They've done nothing wrong in that conversation. Um, and just making sure you're, you're including them with that. You're bringing them on that journey. But it is, it is tricky. Can I just say really quickly on that as well? So having looked at the primary age girls, the bit that we've done that we're going to release um, very early next year um, is looking at the primary age boys because of the impact that the boys were having on the girls and this, this clear tension between the two. Um, and it's been absolutely fascinating, actually. So really focusing on um, this deep, deep, value that's set in boys about purely based on their ability to kick a football you know they're almost valued as human beings for their ability to kick a football it's it's really i'm going to say bonkers again it's really bonkers um so and, and we have to understand that to understand what's happening for the girls um, and so as i sort of alluded to next year we're going to be really focusing on that so the, the research will release early next year and there's going to be um we're hoping to do sort of um, guidance for different settings so whether it's school or parents or which perhaps touched on um other question as well um about what parents can do to um to help how we how we start to tackle this and how we break that down at home and in school and in the community as well did anyone else want to tackle any of the other questions I mean, I'm happy to say something on Siobhan's question. I think, um, you know, when it comes to women's sport, we can't ignore it. it's a physical activity and size and strength can matter. And we want it to be inclusive. Sport's important for everyone. It's important for everybody's well-being. We need a level playing field and we need it to be safe. But I think this is a conversation that requires sensitivity. It requires evidence and it requires us all to be kind and inclusive and not to allow any forces of darkness to create unnecessary tension between us because I think we all share the goal of us all being able to participate in sport but to do it in a way that's safe and inclusive for everybody. Anyone, anyone else want to add? Okay, well then I'd just really like to um, thank all our panellists today. That's been a fantastic conversation and please do hang around for a drink and grab them if you've got a further question and thank you to the audience for coming out on this cold wet day. Thank you. <laughs>